Disruptors and curious minds, CEOs, founders, professionals, heretics, revolutionaries, book lovers, book nerds, welcome to book club. Um, and today we're going to be doing something that I never thought I would be doing, saying something I never thought I'd be saying on on the internet. Uh, today we're trying to separate <laughs> Newton and Aristotle from fighting over who is right about time, and we're going to use... Einstein as a referee to <laughs> first separate them and then bring them together in a unified theory of time, um, theories of general and special relativity, gravitational fields, space time, the fabric of space time fields. Um, yeah, chapter four of The Order of Time by Carlo Rovelli has it all. Um, not sure where to begin, Jeremy. Maybe where do you the- think? Maybe with the hist- a little bit of the history of time, I think that was really interesting. So we talk about the the root of the word time is to divide, right? And to create, uh, you know, to divide something into maybe more manageable and organizable chunks and sections. And I start thinking about, you know, how human beings as a species, you know, their ability to organize, our ability to organize early on kind of led to our, our success and our growth uh, as a species, right? We were able to kind of get everyone together and then point point and organize towards something. And and part of that is, is, you know, this, this idea of time. Um, And, you know, time used to be kind of sun up to sun down kind of thing. And then, you know, right in the middle of the day, sun's in the middle of the sky. That's kind of a coordinating event. Who decided to coordinate those events first? The church, right? Because they did a lot of other things back in the day, both both good and bad. That's another debate. We're not even going to dive into (laughs) that. But, uh, you know, um, sundials all that good stuff right so that was kind of an interesting history on the on on time in general and how we got our arms around it initially right yeah and so that for anyone who's just joining us for the first time you're wondering what the hell we're going on about if you check out episodes one and two of the book club you'll, it'll all make sense they're they're in the link below check them out yeah so it's, it, there's a history of time there's a history of time zones he speaks about the the history of the clock he outlines how we got to where we are and also in the history of the clock a little bit of history of einstein and his job in the patent office and how he was essentially checking patents for time devices because all of the trains were running everyone had different time didn't they back then because the time midday in Lecce was not the same as midday in Milan. Everyone had different times and they were trying to bring them all together because the trains were going so fast that they needed to have the same time in all of these places. And Einstein was working in the patent office, working on those clocks. And ironically, <laughs> during that... <laughs> well, kind of funky, right? And, in, yeah. in, you know, I, I wrote down this note too, like as technology increases, the need for coordination increases even more right you know so it started with coordinating trains to make sure you know if i buy a ticket i have to be there at a certain time because the train's going to be there at a certain time the conductor needs to have the train there at a certain time to satisfy my <laughs> purchase of the ticket right yeah. but you know think about that even more like with with the early internet right and you know all the things that live in between that make the internet work switches and routers and packets and all of that stuff so as tech gets more intense like the coordinated activity needs to be more precise so i thought that was kind of interesting and an early start to all of that stuff yeah it it was all very fascinating and all quite serendipitous and all very eye-opening um and so he chapter four the, the the history lesson and then he gets into the bulk of the the chapter which is essentially trying to answer the question what happens when nothing happens what what is nothing um and the link between nothing in space and nothing in time and he uses the great minds of aristotle and newton to outline the two contrasting camps on that and then use uses einstein to bring them all together yeah and time is when and space is what right? yes I- Thought that was kind of an interesting piece. And then he he mentioned, uh, well, this is more of an Aristotle thing, I think. Time is a measurement of change. Yes. It's how we measure change that goes around goes on in environments around ourselves, right? And but Aristotle also goes in and talks about what place and space is, right? And the place of a thing is what surrounds that thing. 
Okay. So we're as we dive in deeper, I wrote down on the lightness of air as a note, on the lightness of air. And Aristotle believed that um, there's no such thing as an empty space. Something always occupies it. Air occupies that space. And Newton had the opposite opinion uh, of that, think, saying that, you know, it's pure empty space, right? So that's the space side of it. Let's talk about the time side of it. What was Aristotle's explanation of time versus Newton's explanation of time? So if nothing changes, if nothing moves, does time therefore cease to pass? So Aristotle believed that it did. If nothing changes, time does not pass. So um, Aristotle writes in his physics, but some change is happening within the mind. We immediately suppose that some time has passed as well. In other words, even the time that we perceive flowing within us is the measure of a movement, a movement that is internal. If nothing moves, there is no time because time is nothing but the registering of movement. So movement and goes, let's point back to like chapter one, where yes. you know, if time happens, heat is a, is an output of yeah. that. So output of movement, output of time. Yeah. I don't think Aristotle was necessarily thinking in that way about it. Right, right. Yeah. But, I'm just connecting. But, it, yeah. but yeah, exactly. Connecting those dots. It kind of, he was right in that regard that he, that's how he viewed it. Whereas Newton assumed really the opposite where there's this time that moves outside of us that regardless of what happens to us i mean we could all like in a film from the 90s all stop moving everything freezes the planets stop revolving we stop moving water stops flowing but time independent of that will continue on so, so Ravelli asks in this chapter, how on earth do we come across, do we come across the belief and understanding and, and, uh, you know, how do we come to believe that time is this universal coordinated thing? Well, thanks, uh, Newton. It's you, right? Yeah. It, we learned school. it. We learned it in school, didn't we? And that's, and kind Newton of, did yeah. all this other really cool stuff. So time, he's got to be right on the time side. So that's our, that's our shortcut into why we believe that. But this, this quote from that chapter don't take your intuitions and ideas to be natural, right? Meaning like you have uncovered them yourself. You have pushed them around yourself. They're kind of a shortcut, right? And they're often products of audacious thinkers who came before us. So we just jumped on to Newton's shortcut of what time is being this universal and coordinated thing that he calls true time, right? Well, yeah, that, that's the sentence before your quote was before Newton, time for humanity was the way of counting how things changed. Before him, no one had thought it possible that a time independent of things could exist. Yeah, so he changed how we think about the passage of time to such a degree that it's kind of become the norm. And it's that's how we all think about it in school all through our life. That's how we think about it, that Newtonian concept of time. So we so we get into that we get into that piece, which is why it's so difficult to grasp this idea that there is no coordinated time. And 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 Einstein will help explain that in between these two arguing uh, philosopher, physicist, prophets, right, mathematicians, right. But I I, I start thinking about this. All right, so if nothing, if there's no movement. If we're completely still, time doesn't happen. Time doesn't happen, right? So if we're standing here, you and I still, we don't talk, we don't do anything. Does time happen? According to Aristotle, no. According to Newton, yes. But what if what if it's things are happening that we can't perceive? We talked about not being able to see the little small movements of things, like water in a glass. It looks still. No, all that shit's moving in the glass, right? Uh, right. We can't see. We can't see quarks spin up and spin down right that's something moving but we can't perceive it so that that kind of flips me out a little bit too like e there's smaller things happening that we can't perceive so even if we said hey mark nothing's happening so no time is happening there are still things happening we can't perceive it so maybe the universal approach to time is the right one right what about in the cold dark vacuum of space yeah I've never been in one. The, the, the freezing where, where, um, well, that, yeah, that, 
it's in our last weeks where if everything's moving incredibly slowly um anyway so is there a missing piece in this so time 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 does Einstein, and this is where our knowledge, this is where we need a particle physicist to come into here. So the missing ingredient is actually space and time. It, we, we shouldn't be talking about time. We should be talking about space time. Yeah, when in and, doubt, when you can't explain something, mash it together with something else and then see what comes out, right? Um, <laughs> but he's saying that's what Einstein did. No, Just, he's quite a bit smarter than that. Um, so, okay, yeah, so let's talk about space. So time is when, space is what? Right. Um, and I wrote down on the lightness of air, meaning, you know, to kind of, you know, on Aristotle's side, there's no such thing as empty space. You know, there's air that's in space. Right. But Newton's like, yeah, no, it's there's just nothing in the space. Right. Um, so Leibniz, another very intelligent human being, uh, actually had a T in his name, according to Carlo Rovelli. And he actually dropped the T because he didn't agree with Newton's view of true time. And also, empty space so one guy disagreed with him that was pretty wicked smart well <laughs> i think back then if you've got an opinion and you and you, you you plant your flag and you stick to it then um what do you know what his relationship was to einstein sorry that the lieblitz guy no i don't say. i don't i think they maybe were they were they around the same time? Maybe they had some witty banter. Maybe they had maybe they had a book club that um, <laughs> <laughs> they did together. Um, all right, so let's talk about Einstein living in the middle of these two guys, right? And and a lot of things. Uh, there was a little talk about fields. Well, right? it's that yeah. The the synthesis between Aristotle's time and Newton's is the most valuable achievement made by Einstein. It is the crowning jewel of his thought. And essentially, yeah, he starts talking about fields, um, Dirac fields, the electromagnetic fields, and the gravitational field. Which actually what he basically put out there was like space time is the gravitational field. That is and time. vice versa. Yeah. Right. Right. So he's like, no, this is that's time is over here. And it's like this thing. It's a little bit of what you said. It's a little bit of what you said. But Let's talk about the field itself, right? He calls it the structure of reality, an elastic sheet that could be pulled and stretched, right? So remember we had the, the two different times in the mountains and you know down in the valley, yeah, right? I Here's remember. the yeah, a little image of that. So at the top of this, this is where the distortions of space-time actually happen. And there have been measuring they've been measuring the distortions that affect clocks like gravitational field distortions actually affect clocks and they've been measuring that for like a hundred years right yep. so even though you can't get your head around this whole thing of gravitational field as space time the effect on time has been measured for a really long time 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 yeah correct and so like well curved space time and so again it the mass changes the gravitational field, which is why it stretches out as you move away from the Earth's surface. Why is it so hard to grasp, though? Like, why do we? Why do our brains have such a hard time grasping curved space-time? It's because we can't really, we can't really experience it, right? But I, I, it's yeah, we're not. It's like. It's in those astronomical numbers and the, the the distances involved in space and the speed of light and a light year and like yeah we, we're just not most of us aren't programmed to to think in those dimensions in those ways in those numbers time thus becomes part of a complicated geometry woven together with the geometry of space this is the synthesis that einstein found between aristotle's conception of time and Newton. Like, i understand yeah like, Time and space, this is the end of the, the independence, isn't it? Which is the title of the chapter that you can't separate time from space. You can't separate time. It's all connected together. You can't separate them. It's not an independent thing tick-tocking away. I've got and, it. <laughs> and even though we use, well, we use time to coordinate our activities. That's a whole different thing. But like space-time being like the foundational structure of the universe. Yeah. Sounds a lot cooler than a, you know, 
an alarm going off on my Google calendar telling me I have five minutes to prep for a meeting. Yeah, I mean, doesn't affect our day-to-day schedules, but it does affect, I guess, the universe. So, <laughs> whoosh, I just felt the a large object curve my space time mark that means i have to go somewhere else no i think i'm like i'm digging my we're digging ourselves into like some kind of curved hole where we, we're not gonna be able to get out of it some kind of curved black hole of of reckoning well we got it yeah we can't we can't go we can't go forward we have to go back right <laughs> okay sounds good press the edit button yeah okay yes um it's coming together it's all coming together. Time is becoming, it's coming together. There is um, speed changes time, mass changes time. Time is not independent of the world around us. What else? What about those retirement clocks that like, you know, people that work in office jobs, they have on their desk and it's like counts down. Is that not universal time or is that, no? which i don't know i don't know what you're talking about oh, you've never seen one of those so my i think my dad had one back in the day where it like you know counted down like from the year he was if he was going to retire at 65 the clock would you know go back you know tick down like yeah you know, the 20 years till retirement and like a real-time running clock yeah I, I, we, that's it's a bit like the stoic thing memento mori that we spoke about in another book club isn't it where you know you could have a calendar of the days that you have left if you live on average till you're 80 then yeah and that kind of real life facing that realization every day will make you live better did it did it do did it do a good for your dad to have that uh, on his desk it's a good question i need to ask him about that you always got to have something to look forward to i guess yeah um well this yeah so all in all chapter four it was a nice little pause after chapter three i had like we said we had to read that a couple of times to really get my head around it um but Chapter four kind of set the tone of this this great analogy of Arist- or of Einstein sitting in between Aristotle and Newton. Now we move forward in into the next little bit that might uh, be again a little bit more grindy. Yeah, well, I think he was kind of setting up gravitational fields and gravitational time waves. I think he's setting us up for. I mean, chapter five is called Quanta of Time. So stretch out, <laughs> stretch out, buddy. It's going to be a doozy. But hey, keep listening to us, guys. We're going to keep unpacking it, doing our best to uh, to attempt to be part of our, uh, what, uh, quantum mechanical wannabes as we understand the structure of the universe via Carlo yeah. Rovelli, the poet, the philosopher, the physicist. Time travel. Stay curious. Be disruptive. Keep thinking on paper. Till next time.